Good morning, everybody. It is Easter season, and I am thrilled that we can celebrate uh, this season together as a church. Today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, April the 9th will be our community day. We've got some cards. You can just grab a little stack and be inviting folks to come, friends, neighbors, uh, anyone who have kids, invite them to community day. It's going to be a great celebration for us, a way for us just to celebrate the season with our community and to love and serve our community as well. We've got some uh, cool Easter invites as well. It's a little heart slash empty tomb logo. And if you'll grab some of these and say, hey, if you're looking for a place to worship on Easter Sunday, why don't you come meet us at Open Door? And so uh, please utilize these and let's, uh, let's be inviting folks on this special, special time of year. Genesis 22 is our study this morning. Surely one of the most dramatic and important chapters in all of the Bible. All right, let me remind you again that what you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, and what you believe about your circumstances defines your faith. What you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about your circumstances gives definition to your faith. I was talking uh, not too long ago to a friend who was a dad and his son was with him and we're just hanging out and then his son began to tell me a story and and he was telling me a story about him and his dad and and I, I said afterwards I said man your dad sounds super cool and he goes he is and and then he said he said my dad can do anything and and I glanced at the son's dad you know he was a little embarrassed in that moment but at the same time, there was, there was just such a tremendous amount of joy that he had in hearing his son and the faith that his son had in him. The father was very pleased at the extent of the child's faith. And that, that's true for us when it comes to God. So what is faith? You know, it's interesting because the Bible talks about faith as a reality of something that we hope for. Something that we know is real, even though we haven't seen it. That's what faith is. You don't have to see it to know it's real. You believe in it, and by hope, that becomes your reality. Faith. Believing in God is a matter of faith. Believing in something like resurrection from the dead, it's a matter of faith. It is a reality that, that we don't see. It's something that we hope in, even though we have yet to visualize it with our eyes, but it is just as real as if we saw it or touched it. That's what faith is. And God is pleased when you express faith in him. And sometimes God will test you to determine the amount of your faith. God will give you a test to challenge the extent of your faith. And just to be honest, sometimes those are tests that we pass and sometimes they are tests of faith that we fail. So when was the last time that God tested your faith and how did you do? How did you do? And you, have you ever failed a test of faith? Have you ever had a, a greater sense of fear for something other than God? Maybe you feared a person more than God and you failed the test. Listen, Genesis 22 is going to tell us this most imperative truth, and it is this. The testing of our faith strengthens our hope that God has provided our complete salvation in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The testing of our faith strengthens our hope that God has provided a complete salvation in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and we're going to learn today from Father Abraham what he believed about God 
and what he believed about himself and what he believed about him, his circumstances that defined his faith. Let me pray, and then we will engage God's word. Father, now as we get ready to enter into your book, truths that were inspired by your spirit, that were written to transform us. Father, please meet us now. May our study today increase our faith in Christ. May we be willing to live for him all the more. And if there's anyone here this morning who has yet to believe, Father, would you even now by your spirit produce saving faith in that person? To you, we will give all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. A hundred years it took for Abraham finally to receive the covenant blessing of a son. Now, Abraham and Sarah, in their old age, had received a child. It caused them to laugh, and they named him Laughter. And now we had about a decade where Abraham and Sarah and Isaac were finally enjoying the covenant blessings that God had promised to Abraham so many, many years ago. People and possessions and protection and preservation and now all of that will be challenged. And God tested Abraham. And he said, there's three things, Abraham, that I want you to do. And he gave Abraham the strongest test of his faith. Now, we already know that there were times when God had tested Abraham's faith before, and in the past he had failed. Today we will see him succeed Back in Genesis 12, when, when God first met uh, Abram, he, he, he ordered him to do three things. He commanded him to do three things, to leave your home, leave your relatives, and go to a land that you've never seen before. And Abraham obeyed. And now God is going to ask Abraham to do three much more difficult things. Take your only son, the one that you love, go to a mountain that I will designate, climb that mountain and kill your son for me. Offer him as a sacrifice to me. Offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that, that I will tell you. The burnt offering is that, that willing sacrifice to appease a, a righteous and a holy God. Abel did it. And God was pleased. Noah performed the burnt offering after his family left the ark and God renewed the covenant with him and, and God was pleased. And now God says, it would please me, Abraham, if you kill your son, offer him to me as a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice on the altar. And so now, as Moses writes this, what I'm awestruck by is that there's no contention by Abraham. He doesn't plead with the Lord. He just simply obeys. I mean, we've seen in the past where Abraham pleaded with the Lord. We, we've seen in the past where Abraham contended with the Lord. Now he's just silent. He just simply obeys. I'm sure he's wondering, how can I offer my one and only son, my only begotten son, as a blood sacrifice to you, God? I don't understand this, but he, he didn't question God. There is something about Abraham's faith here that I think we must emulate. And it begs the question, why does God test us? Because he does. And why does God test your faith? Is it because he's cruel? No, God is kind. Is, is he out to get you? No. 
He's not vindictive. So why does God give you such tests? Friends, God tests our faith to give us opportunities to reveal the extent of our faith, to display our our loving obedience to God, and to reveal the righteousness that we've been given. That's why God does this. He wants to give you an opportunity to love him and obey him. He wants you, uh, he wants to give you an opportunity to reveal the righteousness that has been given to you by faith in his son, Jesus. And so he'll test your faith. Abraham, how righteous are you? How much do you love me? What do you believe about me? What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about your circumstances? Well, then take your son, your only son, go to the mountain and offer him up to me as a burnt offering. Verse three, so Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and he set out to go to the place that God had told him about. No delay. Father Abraham simply (laughs) obeys the Lord. Not contending, simply obeying, gathering the needed supplies and making his way on a a three-day journey to a place called Mount Moriah. And as a dad, I I spent a lot of time this week thinking about what would I be thinking about if I had just one son and God told me to offer him up in death. And I just can only imagine the internal struggle that Abraham was experiencing. Three days. Lots of opportunity to turn back. Maybe Abraham is thinking, oh, surely, God, what you want me to do is turn around and go back home. Ha, this is just a test. I'm going to go home because, you see, this son is the son of the promise. He bears the seed of the promise. So surely you don't, you don't want me to take his life, right? But then he didn't receive any other commands from God just to go to the mountain and offer him. Go to Moriah. Moriah would become a very important place in biblical history. Mount Moriah would be conquered by Joshua and the children of Israel. He would be given to Caleb as a gift because of his faithfulness. Later, later David would purchase this, this, this area as a, as a part of, of his kingdom. Mount Moriah would eventually be called Mount Zion. And Solomon would build a temple there. And then many years later, a man named Herod would build a great temple there. And then one day, Jesus would walk into that temple and he would clear it. And he would demand of those who officiated the temple, who were accusing him in that moment, he would say, tear this temple down and in three days, I will rebuild it. There's just something important about three days. God wants to show his resurrecting power. And on the third day, verse 4, the third day, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, you stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. then we'll come back to you. Why does he talk in plural here? Why doesn't he say, then I'll come back to you? He says, then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and and he laid it upon his son Isaac. And in his hand, he took fire and the knife The two of them walked on together. How could God keep his covenant promise to me? Abraham must have been thinking. 
how is this all going to work out? Will God resurrect my son on this third day? What will happen? How, how will Abraham be able to, to prove his faith? How, how was it that Abraham knew somehow that he and his son would return? And the author of Hebrews gives us a little insight in chapter 11 and 19. As Abraham was contemplating all of this, it's recorded in scripture, and Abraham considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. At some point, Abraham believed that God, even if I offer you my son in death, somehow you will bring him back to me. Somehow, my son, on the third day, he will return. And so Abram, Abraham with his son ascended the hill, the father carrying the torch of fire and a butcher's knife. And he places the burden of the wood on the back of his son, just like the burden of a wooden cross would one day be placed on the back of Christ as he ascended up the hill called Calvary. And they both climb up this hill, Abraham and Isaac, in order to worship God, which tells us something really important about worship, does it not? Worship demands sacrifice. Worship demands sacrifice. You, you just don't come here, Christian, and walk into this comfortable room and enjoy this comfortable environment and, and sing these wonderful songs and pray and hear from God's word. You don't just do all of this and walk away saying, I have worshiped God without a sacrifice. A sacrifice is demanded. You just don't come to this table and, and eat the bread and drink the cup unless you understand that worship demands sacrifice. And it is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we receive so that we can freely worship God, so that in return we offer our bodies as living sacrifices to him, holy and acceptable to, be, to God. That is just a reasonable act of our worship. Worship demands sacrifice. And Abraham said, I've got to go worship God, and that's going to demand a sacrifice. Now it's just Abraham and Isaac. And as they're making their way up Mount Moriah, finally Isaac speaks and he, he says to his father Abraham, and he says, my father, and Abraham in return replies, here I am, my son. And Isaac says, hey, Dad, we've got the fire. I I've got the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And now we see the faith in Abraham that I so desperately want to emulate. Abraham answers, God himself will provide God himself will provide my son, the lamb, for the burnt offering. And then the two of them walked on together. The sacrificial lamb, God himself will provide it. God himself will provide the needed sacrifice. And in that moment, Abraham believed, and in that moment, Isaac believed by way of the faith of his father. He believed. And, and, and they both obeyed. And in that moment, Abraham 
became willing to offer his son up in death, if necessary, knowing that God himself will provide. Kay and I have a son that is soon to be married. And he was just about Isaac's age when we were told, this is about 20 years ago, we were told that he was dying and he needed a severe and immediate transplant that most likely he would not survive. And we had to sign off on the procedure. That was a difficult test. What do I believe about you, God? What do I believe about myself? What do I believe about these circumstances? And knowing that my son had faith in me that I would not put him through something like that, that he didn't feel that, that I could not endure or, or handle what, what kind of belief did my son have in his father. And I'm telling you, it was very difficult for me to maintain faith. I wasn't sure I would pass the test. And by God's grace and by his favor, he allowed him to survive. How, how does a father answer a son? when he knows soon he may die. And how did Jesus, when he met with his father there in the garden and he pleaded with him and he said, Father, if there is any other way than for me to drink the cup of death on a cross, if there's any other way for your will to be done, would you allow that? And, and, and the father gave no response to Jesus, and Jesus simply says, then your will be done. You see, even if Isaac would have been sacrificed, it would not have been enough. It took the sacrifice of Jesus, God's only begotten son, for it to be enough. And it is God who decides the sacrifices that, that are necessary. It is up to us simply to believe and trust in him. But we know that God will test our faith in order for us to have an opportunity to display the extent of our faith in him. Verse 9, when they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the off altar he arranged the wood and he bound his son Isaac and he placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out and he took the knife to slaughter his son. It's amazing to me if we've been studying Genesis that typically Moses writes in years or decades, and sometimes Moses writes in centuries, but now he slows down to the minute, even to the very second. He just slows way down so that we can picture this. Abraham takes time to, to make an altar of stones. He puts the wood on the altar. He sets it then ready to, to just be put on fire and, he binds up his son and he lays his son on top and now he's got the knife just ready to kill his child. Hmm. And, and now we see the tremendous faith of Father Abraham. And, and now we also understand something that is really important about faith, that, that real faith demands obedience and obedience then displays real faith. They go hand in hand. That's why when you read James, and you, you might get a little confused because 
here we know from Paul's writings that it is by faith alone that one is justified. And then James would say, yeah, but, but faith without works is dead. It is works that justifies. And, and James is simply saying, no, no, no. You don't, you, what I'm trying to tell you is this. There's something about real faith. There's something about real faith that is revealed in your works, that is revealed in your obedience. That's why James, as he talks about Abraham, he says, wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, that faith was active together with his works, and by his works, his faith was made complete. Yeah, of course, it is faith that justifies, but real faith obeys. Even the most difficult of tests. In this moment, out of all the things that Abraham had done to show his faith in his life, in this moment, Abraham's faith was made complete. He has got the knife ready to pierce his son. And this is where we just have to ask the question is, is your faith strong enough? Is it deep enough? Is, is your love for the Lord great enough? Could you pass the test? You see, there's got to be something about your ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ that allows you to pass the test of faith when it comes. And in that moment, Abraham passes the test of faith. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And, and he says again, here I am. And this, this beautiful pericope is sort of uh, formed or written around this statement. Here I am. Here I am. And the angel says, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your only son from me. And so the angel intervenes. And he cries out to Abraham in a loud, audible voice. And now here's father Abraham and he hears the angel and he says, I'm right here. Lord, I'm doing what you commanded me to do. I'm right here ready to slay my son, my only son, as a sacrifice. Here I am being loyal to you, God. And just with seconds to spare, this, this angel commands Abram not to go through with it. And then the Lord through this angel, praises Abraham for his unparalleled faith and reverence for God. Now God the Father is pleased with the faith that his son Abraham has displayed. And now Abraham, verse 13, looks and he, he sees a, a lamb, a male lamb, a ram, caught in the thicket by its horns. So he quickly, he goes and he takes the ram. <laughs> he unbinds his son. And he offers the ram as a, a burnt offering, a blood sacrifice on the altar to God in the place of his son. And in that moment, Abraham now has been given sight to his faith. When his son Isaac said, where's the lamb? And Abraham replies, God will provide the lamb, my son. Faith is that substance where we believe in that which we cannot see and hope for things that we know are real. And in that moment, now Abraham understands and he sees and he, he declares that mountain to be called, the Lord will provide. And even to this day, Moses writes that that place is called the Lord's provision. And so Abraham, he, 
he received from God a substitutionary sacrifice. God provides a substitute sacrifice for Abraham. And Abraham willingly receives this, this lamb as a substitute for his son. Just at the right time, God provided the right sacrifice. Just as Paul says, yes, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a virgin and born under the weight of the law, so that we might redeem, be redeemed from the weight of the law, so that we could become adopted sons just at the right time. The lamb became the substitutionary sacrifice. And so Abraham, he never forgot that place. He called that mountain Jehovah Jireh. That's the place where the Lord provided. That's where God provided that acceptable sacrifice for us. And, and so now we know how all of this so clearly foreshadows both the death and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the third day, Isaac, as it were, was put to death as a sacrifice. He came back to life. The angel of the Lord then calls to Abraham a second time from heaven and says, by myself, I have sworn that this is the Lord's declaration. And now the Lord is just going to, again, reaffirm the covenant promise and the covenant blessings to Abraham. Because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and of the sand of the seashore. And your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my word. And Abraham went back to his, young, the, to his young men, just as he had said, we'll go up there and we'll worship, and then we will both return. And they got up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham settled in Beersheba. In the rest of the chapter, Moses, interestingly enough, records the, the lineage of Abraham's brother who had 12 sons and, and Abraham just had one, just one. And yet through the angel, the promise was through that one son, just, just that one son, your offspring, not, not your offsprings, not, not in plural. It just takes one son, Abraham. It just takes one son to fulfill all of my covenant promises and blessings. And because Abraham did not hold anything back from God, God blessed him. That's exactly what the angel said. He said, Abraham, at the end of verse 16, you, you, haven't, you haven't withheld anything from me. You haven't withheld anything from me. That's my desire. I don't want to hold anything back from God. That, that's my prayer. That's, that's what I seek. That's what I long for. I want to live a life like Abraham. I don't hold anything back from you, God. I give you everything. Nothing withheld. And in return, God promises Abraham, that through the one son, all of the covenant promises and all of the covenant blessings would come true. And it did come true for us through the one son, Jesus, all of the covenant promises and all of the covenant blessings, they all come true. They all come true. And Abraham becomes this, this model to us now that we can imitate that we can also believe in Jesus, that God would fulfill all of his promises through his one 
and only son. And Abraham, having pa passed the test of this faith, he reminds us, you don't have to fully understand what God is doing, but you do have to believe. He, he, sometimes you're not supposed to understand everything that God is doing. You're just supposed to believe. Because it's, it's, it seems like this, this is how it works between God and us. First comes the testing, which is to be followed by obedience. And then comes the provision. Because see, sometimes God doesn't want to give you the provision until he knows that you'll pass the test of faith. Sometimes there's the test awaiting your obedience, and then comes the provision, just like Abraham. I, I don't want you ever to forget this chapter of the Bible. And, and, and can you not see how Christ is everywhere here? Sometimes we, we ask the question, where, where's Jesus in this chapter? Is, is Christ found in, 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 in the faith of Abraham, willing to do the will of God? Is Christ found in, in Isaac, the son, who is placed on the altar of sacrifice? Is, is Christ found in the sacrifice itself? Is Christ found in, in the lamb that was provided as the substitutionary atonement? Where is Jesus in this? Well, he is everywhere in this chapter. He is all of this and more. He is the one who perfectly obeyed the will of the Father. He is the Son who became the willing sacrifice. He is our substitutionary atonement for us so that we would not have to suffer and die and face the judgment of God. Yes, it's, it's all of that. And so, listen, ultimately, what we have to ask is, what is the extent of your faith in Jesus? What is it? Before Pastor Eric comes and makes an offer for you to freely walk up to this table and, and take uh, these little goblets and, and receive the bread and, and drink the cup, would you ask yourself, Jesus, how much do I believe in you? And how much am I wanting to obey you now? Without faith, friends, it is impossible to please God. And so now like Abraham, let, let's, let's have that type of faith. But let me say one last thing. As much as Genesis 22 teaches us about Abraham's faith, it teaches us more about God's faithfulness, amen? I mean, yes, we learn a lot about Abraham's faith in this chapter, but that's not what's most important. What's most important is that the Lord provided his own son to be your sacrifice. He proves his faithfulness to us first so that we can respond by faith in return. Let's pray. Father, I, even today, I'm just not sure I would pass the test of faith like Abraham did. And I would ask that you would grant me more faith, grant my brothers and sisters more faith this morning, more faith than we have received in the past. And yes, Father, we know you'll test us, and in the testing, you're just wanting us to love you by obedience knowing that you are Jehovah Jireh, you will provide everything according to your perfect will, just as you provided your son and our savior to be our substitutionary sacrifice. Now may we meet you around the table that belongs to Christ. Father, be pleased as your church is united together as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.